Yeah, good morning. So if you want to um, um, join the demo later and follow along with code examples, uh, you can clone this repository. Uh, maybe you already have. So this uh, talk is about concurrency. And uh, of course, Ruby doesn't have the best reputation when it comes to concurrency. But if you actually look at it, the, uh, there's, there's actually a few very nice ways to do it in the standard library. Uh, and today we're going to talk about that, and uh, I'm going to use the example of, uh, of, a, of a chat room. So I work on a, a monitoring tool called AppSignal, and we do error and performance monitoring for uh, Ruby applications. Um, so uh, during this work, so we both have to process a lot of data, mostly in Ruby, and we integrate with every Ruby web server that's out there. So we've kind of had to support all these, uh, these models. There's a bit of feedback, isn't there? Um, hopefully we can do something about that. Okay, yeah, that's better, thank you. So um, there's, there's basically in Ruby at least three ways to do concurrency. You can either uh, spawn multiple processes, you can run multiple threads, or you can use an event loop. So we're, uh, we're going to, uh, to, to treat, uh, uh, we're going to talk about all three of these models. Um, so you might know these web servers, um, and there are, there are uh, well-known examples of, of uh, using one of these models. Um, so Unicorn, of course, uses multiprocess, uh, Pumas uh, uses threads and fin uh, event loops. Um, and the example we're going to use is an extremely minimalistic uh, Slack clone. So it's going to be the worst Slack clone that exists in the world, and it, I don't think it's going to get a lot of VC funding, but still uh, we're going to see how far we can get with just a couple of lines of Ruby. Um, and I'll now give a very short demo of the actual Slack clone. Um, um, it's okay. Yeah. okay. Sure. Like a switch. So, um, so uh, Mascara here is, uh, is is helping me today with uh, with this demo. So hopefully, when he types something, oh, it's broken, of course. <laughs> Let's try again. Okay, yeah, so this is our great Slack clone. So basically you can type some stuff into it and, and if you, whenever you press enter, uh, it will get sent to all the other clients that are connected to the server. Um, and I implemented this in three different ways. So there's a, there's a multi-process, a threaded, and an evented version of it. So we will now look at the implementations of these uh, servers. Um, so first let's look at the, at the, chat, at, uh, the Slack client. So what this does, it, it loads in the socket library from uh, the Ruby standard lib. And it opens a TCP socket to, uh, to the server. And then it starts a, a thread that just listens to, uh, uh, listens tries to get uh, uh, data from the, from the socket and just outputs that on the command line. And it also runs a loop that's down there starting at line 10 uh, that, gets in, that gets input from the standard in, which basically means that whatever you type uh, gets, gets uh, put into this loop and then sends it back to the client. So basically this, this is all you need for a very, very simple chat client. It, uh, it, it just sends some data back and forth and, and prints it out uh, uh, to, to the relevant place. Um, yeah, so let's first let's look at the multiprocess version of the server. So uh, how that usually works, for example, a unicorn, and also sort of in this example, only it's, it's simpler, is that you have a master process, uh, and that basically that doesn't actually handle any traffic itself. It just uh, it, it just sits there, and it it manages other processes, and uh, this whenever a connection comes in. Uh, uh, the master uh, gets one, one of its children to, uh, to actually uh, do traffic for that connection. Uh, and whenever a worker dies or something like that, then the, the master can start a new one. 
And how that usually works, uh, that, that sort of looks lump, something like this, or if you uh, l would look at top on your laptop for, uh, for Unicorn. So you have one master process and a couple of worker processes, and uh, basically they share no nothing at all. They're just completely isolated by the operating system. Um, so let's look at some code for our very simplistic Slack server. Um, so th this code is shared for, for all three of the servers. So again, we load in the socket library, um, and then it starts the server on port, uh, port 2000. And basically, that's all you need. So, so all the complicated networking stuff is done for us by, uh, by Unix and by the Ruby uh, uh, standard library. And then we need to set up some, uh, some communication between these processes. So this uses a, a, a pipe. Uh, and this io.pipe in Ruby basically maps directly to a Unix pipe. So if, you, uh, if you've ever used uh, that, that, that uh, pipe command on the, in bash, for example, you've also used a pipe. So for example, if you do ps uh, pipe grab Ruby, that's exactly the same technology that we're using here. Uh, so this, this, makes, uh, this, this makes one reader or writer to the master, and this allows the child processes to write data to the master processes. And it, uh, it also declares an array with client writers, and this allows to, uh, so whenever we fork, uh, whenever we start a uh, child process, that adds a pipe to, the, to this array, and then the master process can loop through that array and, and send data to all of its children. And then uh, this is where sort of where the magic happens. So we, we start a loop and we try to accept the connection on the server. So this blocks, this just waits for, uh, for a new connection to come in. Um, then it sets up these, uh, these pipes uh, so, so we can communicate between these processes. And then it forks. And a fork is how, uh, how these, these child processes were actually created. So when you fork a process, Again, this is a Unix thing. It, it's, the Ruby mapping for this is very simple. It basically just does a system call. Uh, and when you, do, when you do a fork, then the, and the process as, as it is at that time uh, is, is, is copied to a new process with exactly the same state. So basically, it just starts executing exactly at, uh, in this line of code, but then in a new process. That, uh, uh, and, and then the master process just continues on to the next loop. So that means that whenever, we, uh, whenever somebody connects to our server, we actually get a new process on my laptop. So if the whole room would do that right now, probably my laptop, would, my, my fan would be start spinning and I would maybe even uh, 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 get out of memory errors. So, uh, but I don't see a lot of laptops in the room, so I don't think that will happen right now. <laughs> um, yeah, and then uh, we get to what the, what, the, what, the, what the chart process is actually doing. So it starts by reading a nickname from the client. So, uh, so in, the, in the client uh, Ruby file, it actually transfers the, the first argument. It just writes it out immediately. And the server just ex accepts the first read it can do from the, from the client to contain a nickname. And then it does client.put. And this means that uh, it just it writes, uh, it just puts this string to the client. And the client will receive it and print it out uh, to the uh, command line again. Um, then we write, uh, uh, this, this runs a little loop that just that writes messages to the client. So you can find the code for this in the examples if you uh, want to see that. Um, and then we have a similar loop as in the client. So it, it just loops endlessly and it just tries to, to read data from the client. And whenever it gets some data, it, it uh, gets written back to the master writer. So it end up, ends up in the master process and then the master process writes it to all the, all the other child processes, which write it back to the clients. So this is actually an extremely inefficient uh, chat system. But it, it does work, so that's, that's a good thing about it. So that's, that's basically all there is to it. See, this, this is kind of like a unicorn for, uh, for Slack. That's, um, um, so, there's a couple of pros to this approach. So one, f one pro is that you basically don't have to think about concur concurrency at all, because if you fork, then the OS will just load balance everything and, and, uh, uh, and, and there's no, really no potential for error there. 
Uh, and another nice thing about it is that if you have a system that can crash a lot, then uh, uh, the, o the operating system is very good at, uh, at killing processes. So, for example, at GitHub, they use this approach a lot because they, they run Git commands on the command line whenever you do something in the UI. Uh, and that often fails or it generates a lot of memory. And uh, uh, so, they, so they, uh, they use this approach to make sure that, uh, that their processes stay in a stable state. Uh, there's also a few cons. So each process uh, uh, loads to full code base in memory. That's not entirely true, but mostly. Um, so you spend a lot of memory and, uh, and operating system resources on, uh, on, uh, on this approach. So it doesn't really, it, it, it's nice if you handle HTTP requests, for example, because then you, uh, um, then you, uh, then you don't have that many concurrent connections. But for a chat system, it basically makes no sense at all. So that was multi-process, and uh, I think now we're getting to a multi-threading approach, which makes a bit more sense, but is still quite a uh, heavy weight for a chat system. So what happens here is that you have one, um, uh, you have one process, and that runs multiple threads, which, which all handle a connection, uh, but they're all running in the context of the same process. So they share memory, and, uh, uh, which makes a few things easier and a few things harder. So this ex uh, the first piece of uh, the TCP server, uh, of the chat server written in uh, with threads is exactly the same. We just start the TCP server again. Um, but then things kind of change. So, how so this is kind of like our database, this array. So an anytime somebody types a message, we're just going to push it on the, onto this messages array. But um, since multiple threads can do multiple things at the same time, um, we need to protect this data in some way, and that's why we have this mutex. So a mutex uh, uh, you, is, is an uh, object you can lock, and uh, uh, this makes sure that, that only one thread will actually write to this messages array at the, at the same time. Um, and then we have, uh, uh, again, uh, a sort of similar uh, uh, approach, uh, but then using threads. So that's the same loop. So this loop, we're still wait, trying to accept the connection from the server. And whenever you accept the connection, we spawn a new thread. Uh, again, the nickname is read from that thread. And then there's, uh, uh, we run another thread that just sends incoming messages back to, uh, uh, back to the client. We will uh, see that in, uh, on the next slide. And then we, we run another loop that's reading them from the client. So uh, this is the code to, uh, to, to, um, to uh, uh, read this, uh, read the message from the client. So, oops. Um, so we start by, uh, by, by doing a mutex, starting a mutex.synchronize block. So this locks the mutex and makes sure that, uh, that, that other threads will have to wait before they push a message onto the messages array. And then we basically just, uh, just, just uh, add a, a message hash with some, some metadata, and this is the incoming text that somebody typed into their uh, command line. Um, and the same thing happens when you write it back. You, uh, uh, we need to, uh, to lock, the, lock the mutex again, because otherwise there might be weird uh, funky business with the timestamps. And then we just get, get all the messages that haven't been sent now, that haven't been sent yet, and then we... Uh, uh, put the send until time on time.now, so we, we know uh, what the latest timestamp uh, was for the message, last message that was sent. And then uh, we just send, write them, uh, all these messages back to the client and just sleep for a little bit and then do the whole thing again. And if you would look at this in your process manager uh, that supports, uh, uh, if it supports threads, it would be something like this. So the, so the, the process has one ID uh, but it does have multiple synchronous threads running at the same time. Um, and in Ruby, there's, there's a few things you have to take care of when you, uh, when you run threads. So Ruby, there's a, a thing called the global interpreter lock. And that means that, that, that uh, the whole uh, virtual machine of Ruby is always locked when you run a, a line of Ruby code. Um, so if you do a lot of CPU intensive stuff, then uh, only one thread will be active at the same time. But the only exception to, to that is, uh, is, is, uh, is I.O. So if you read or write from a socket or you uh, do an API call or uh, write something to disk, that will be outside of this lock. And that's why threads in Ruby can still be very useful. 
And of course, you have to think about thread safety. So, um, so if, if you would not have mutex in this example, and you would have a pretty high volume of, uh, of people chatting, then, uh, um, then, then, then people will probably miss messages, or the ordering will be wrong, and that will be very hard to debug problems. So the pro is that it uses a lot, of, uh, a lot less memory than uh, multiprocess. And you can share, the, share data, which, uh, which means you don't have to do any weird stuff with this pipe, pipe, for example. You can just put stuff on an array, and all the threads will be able to access it. And the con is that you have to make sure that, that everything uh, you do is thread safe. And, uh, and, you, and you have to be careful, uh, um, uh, uh, you have to be careful not, not to use too much CPU intensive stuff in one process. Otherwise, you're only going to use one core instead of all your cores. So finally, we arrive at the, ev the uh, event loop model. Um, so this is great if you have a large number of concurrent uh, I.O. operations. Um, and the funny thing about an event loop is that it, it's not actually concurrent. It's just, it, it, just, uh, it, just uh, it, it kind of fakes concurrency by just doing uh, uh, small things very fast in a, in a row. So how this sort of works? So uh, uh, event loop model is is dependent on the on the operating system actually doing the uh, the hard work. So so the operating system is keeping track of everything that the network and the disk uh, of a server is doing, and then it can uh, it can it, it can trigger uh, things in your process whenever something is ready. So on most event loop implementations, these events would end up on a queue, and uh, Uh, and there's, 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 a, there's a loop running that basically pops events of, the, of, of that queue and does stuff with it. Usually there's some kind of storage as well, so you can store some metadata about, uh, about clients, for example. Uh, and the event loop can also add stuff on, onto the event queue, and it can tell the OS what, uh, what, what, what it's actually interested in. Um, so again, this is the exactly, exactly the same code. Um, but now the impl implementation is, is different again. So we don't need the mutex here because it's a single thread. It's just a, it's just a single loop that's running in one thread and that's endlessly repeating. So we just keep a hash of clients that we will store some information, for example, the nickname of the connected user in. And we will keep, uh, again, an array of messages. Um, and then we just basically, re all we do is run a loop. So there's a loop. This is a slightly more simplified version compared to the diagram I just showed. Uh, uh, so this is, this is even simpler. Even, uh, simpler. Uh, so, so what the loop do does, it, it just tries to see if there's a new incoming connection. Then it asks the uh, operating system, is there anything I can read or write from? And then it reads messages, to, uh, reads messages from connections that are readable and writes messages to uh, connections that are writable. Um, so the first part of the loop look, looks like this. So uh, again, it asks the server for, an, for a new connection, only this time we use a non-blocking version. Um, uh, this is in the Ruby standard library too. And the difference between uh, the normal accept and the non-blocking accept is that the normal accept will just will wait for a new uh, connection to come in. So if you do server.accept and there's no client, and the client shows up two minutes later, the, the, the method call will just, you will basically be stuck there for two minutes. And the non-blocking version uh, will just see like, is there an incoming connection now? And if not, it, it will raise an exception. So that's why we rescue that exception here. If, if, if this exception occurs, as th this means as at the moment there's no new incoming connection. If there is an incoming connection, then we uh, uh, create a client and we add it to the client storage we, uh, we set up earlier. And this means that whenever uh, one of the uh, uh, a connection for a client is ready, we can still like find out what the nickname and IP address of that client is. Um, then we get to the, sec uh, the second part of the loop. Um, this uses io.select, which again is, is a very lightweight wrapper around the system call. So this uh, asks the operating system 
Uh, I'll give you a list of sockets, and please tell me whenever one of these sockets is ready to either read or write to. And wait for, uh, wait for a little bit of time to, uh, to, uh, to do this. So since, we, since this is an event loop, we want things to be really fast and, uh, and, and have a small batch size. So we just wait for, for 10 milliseconds, and if there's nothing there, we'll, we go on to the next tip, tick. Um, and then we see if we can read some, some incoming messages from, from a client. So uh, this, this is a list of all the readable uh, connections. So we try to, uh, we try to read some te text from that, from that socket. And then we get the client back from the storage that we set up. So, so, and since we have this client now, we, can, uh, we know what the nickname of, of, of the user is, and we can use that to, uh, to, uh, to write information later. And finally, uh, we try to write, write new incoming messages to the clients that are ready to write to. Um, so again, we, can, we get the client back from the storage, and we get messages we want to send. This is in the example, if you want to know how it works. And we just write back that, uh, that information to the socket. And we uh, store uh, what the last write time of, the, of, of this client was. And well, that's basically all there's to it. This is this is a full event loop. It's very naive, and you can break it in a lot of ways. But uh, uh, I've, even the more uh, complex and production-ready event loops basically use these uh, these same principles. So the pro is that that the amount of memory over it per connection is extremely low because there's there's basically we just put one a small hash into an array for every connection, and that's that's all the memory we need to. Uh, to, uh, to manage this whole thing. So that's why it can scale to a huge amount of, of uh, concurrent connections compared to the other approaches. Um, so there's a few cons as well. So one is that, uh, uh, well, we all know JavaScript uh, callback hell. And uh, so, it, it, so it's been, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's quite easy, like if the event loop gets more complex to add like a callback system, and that can be extremely hard to debug and annoying. I think we've all been there. Um, and uh, another issue that is that, that the work done per, per uh, uh, iteration of the event loop has to, be, uh, has, to be, has to have a really small batch size. Because if, uh, if you take a long time on, on handling one message, then the whole system will stall because basically everything is waiting for this, uh, this, this loop to iterate to the next tick. So that was, that was it. So uh, let's try to uh, uh, let's try these three different uh, uh, servers and see uh, if my laptop breaks. Did any, anybody clone the repository by any chance, except for you? So we, um, on the left side, you can see the, the, the chat server running. Hmm? Yeah.
So we, um, there's a few people at least in the chat room at the moment. So uh, if you look on, on the left side of the screen, that's, uh, that's the log of the chat server. So um, uh, there's a few people, uh, well, somebody hacked it already, thank you. <laughs> that didn't take long. Uh, um, so the, um, but the interesting thing now is happening on the right side. So this is the, the multi-process version of the, of the server. And you can see here that, that this is uh, 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 the, the, the output of PS3. And this shows you um, uh, 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 the, the process is running on my computer in a nested way. So there's one master process at the top. And then you can see there's, that we have a separate process for every client that's connected now. So um, please, don't, uh, please don't put uh, the connection logic in the loop, because then you will break my laptop. <laughs> Um, so you have to reconnect now if you still want to type. Um, so now I start the threaded version, and as you can see now, there's there's connections coming in, but there's actually just we still have one process in the in the in the list on the right side. So this one will uh, uh, will use a lot less memory. Um, so this should, should go fairly well with, uh, with the current load. And then finally I'll run the evented version. And the difference between this one and, uh, and the threaded version is actually a lot harder to see because it's uh, uh, in the process list, it will also show up as a single process. Um, but you would probably only really start noticing the, the difference in memory usage uh, uh, after hundreds of thousands of connections. So um, that's why I wrote a little script for that. So, so um, this is a little script that, uh, that starts up uh, a new thread connecting to the server uh, uh, a lot of times. Um, oh, actually I forgot to, uh, I just made a change before the presentation and I didn't do that in the script, so I cannot run it now. But you could put a little loop around, uh, around, around uh, the connection logic and that will uh, 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 create a huge amount of connections. So that was my presentation. Are there any questions? <laughs> yeah. Uh, would you recommend for the bug thread uh, multi thread applications and efficient this event loop? Because you said uh this event loop is not about the bug. What would you um, I think that's kind of the, the, the issue with the event loop is that, that it's, it's just logic. So you cannot really, debugging tools don't really help you that much. Um, so I think, uh, I guess the answer would be that I don't really know. You're, you'd be sort of on your own because uh, you, yeah, you would have to just debug your own logic. Yeah, well, it's 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 uh, it's just a single thread running a loop. So you you yeah you'd really uh, I think the tools couldn't really assist you that much because it's it's really just like like logic and not it's not really like an issue where uh, 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 that the OS or a debugging tool can help you uh, uh, with that much. Um, no, I haven't actually. I should do that. What should, what, uh, um, well, it would definitely be nice if there was uh, was a, a standardized way to do uh, uh, do something like this. I think at the moment it's actually a little bit better than most people give Ruby credit for, because all the usual stuff just works really well. And um, 
uh, I was I, I've asked one of the core team members at some point like whether they they were seriously considering removing the global lock, and they basically said no because they they are afraid that every gem in the entire ecosystem will break. So I think uh, uh, so I think the chances of the global lock ever being removed are pretty pretty slim. So I think uh, yeah so it would be good if there was some kind of like IO fiber based thing uh, uh, in the in MRI in the future to work around this. Real, yeah, I've seen it. It's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, um, it's. I think it's. It, I think the fiber-based approach is uh, is fine. Uh, I tried to use it at, at some point, uh, um, and this, it's 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 a decent approach. I think. It's. Uh, I, uh, I haven't tried it myself uh, enough to know that. Uh, to be honest, we use uh, we use Rust now for uh, for most of our high uh, throughput code. So uh, so we've been we've been we haven't been looking at the newest like high concurrency Ruby stuff that much. Yeah. How do you test with the threaders on Rust? Sorry. How do you test? Write test for this. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Well, I think the same way as usual. You could write a unit test uh, that just calls the loop and see and see if the if the end result is correct. Um, and of course, you could also write some kind of integration test for this. It just starts a client and a server, and just writes uh, data back and forth and and sees if if uh, the result is correct. I've actually considered doing that for this code as well because I was changing it a little bit and the manual testing to see if it still works was getting really annoying. Um, so I would say yes, the, it's the same way as usual. Yeah. Um, not sure what's going on here. Maybe I broke my age stop. Um, but you're absolutely right. I left the copy and write thing out uh, to make it a bit simpler. But in uh, 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 nowadays, of course, if you fork a process, then the whole real stack, for example, doesn't uh, 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 doesn't use any more memory. But you would still use a lot of file descriptors. So um, I was trying out the process version on my laptop. Um, uh, to see how well it would scale, and I think we had about 500 connections. Uh, this machine has 8 gigs of RAM. At about 500 connections, it already I already got problems, and I actually couldn't kill the process anymore because there were no open file descriptors to run kill with. So um, uh, it, it, I think in the end you're probably right, and it's uh, it's it's more the the number of file descriptors, and uh, uh, that's the bottleneck nowadays than the memory. Any more questions? Yeah, all right. We're running out of time. Let's applause. Okay. Yeah, thank you. thank you. Concurrence is quite complicated all the time, so I, I hope it becomes really much simpler right now for people in the audience. We have five minutes break. Don't uh, go away far away. Uh, we will change presentation and continue.